This afternoon, we're really lucky to have Swami Chagananda, who's the head of the Boston Center and has been in this country for 25 years. I just found out today. So he has come to visit us before. He has also written two or three books, one on Bhyana Yoga and one on Karma Yoga. And I can't remember the names. One of them is Walk the Walk. That's the Karma Yoga. Karma Yoga. And what's the one for? Knowing the Knower. Knowing the Knower. And he does a very, very lucid explanation of these yogas. So this evening we'll be hearing about Jnana Yoga and Bhakti Yoga. Please. Let's start with a short prayer. <laughs> Om Asatoma Satkamaya Tamasoma Jyotir Gamaya Mrityorma Amritam Gamaya Aviravir Mahethi Rudrayate Takshinam Mukham Tenamam Pahi Nityam May the Divine lead us from the unreal to the real, from darkness to light, from death to immortality. May the Divine Consciousness fill our hearts and protect us. Peace, peace, peace. Friends, I'm happy to be here and to share with you a few thoughts on the dilemma that sometimes we all experience among the many dilemmas and doubts that we have in our spiritual quest. One of them concerns the connection between love and knowledge. We might begin or it might be helpful to ask a question that perhaps many of us may not have asked ourselves and that would be given a choice what would I prefer to to know people to know others and be known by them or to love others and be loved by them and I'm sure if that kind of a question is asked we might have different uh, answers from. Some people might prefer um, love, some prefer knowledge, some might want both, some might ask whether do we have any choice in the matter, uh, some might say wouldn't one lead to the other and so on. So similar question can be asked in our spiritual quest as well. Do I want to know God or do I want to love God? Again, I think a similar range of answers may be possible. Now, the spelling out the ideal in terms of knowledge, knowing God, that often is associated with a part of the spiritual disciplines called Jnana Yoga and about loving God or experiencing God's love that is often associated with the practice of Bhakti Yoga. And so this dilemma about knowledge and love like other dilemmas can sometimes come in the hearts of spiritual seekers. And what can help us in solving this and similar dilemmas in life is to go and ask ourselves some very basic questions. The dilemmas also come because whenever we have more than one things to choose from, there is always a feeling uh, whether which is better. Is this better? Is this quicker? 
which is higher, which is lower. And that's just the way the human mind thinks. There are popular misconceptions associated with these two ways of approaching God through knowledge or through love. One popular misconception is that somehow the path of knowledge is identified with non-dualism. That somehow it is beyond personalities. And the path of love or path of bhakti is often associated with dualism, a dualistic way of approaching the reality. But that's not the case. It's again a popular misconception. Now, the best way, as I said, would be to go to the root of the matter. So, if we can begin by asking, what is yoga itself? Now, yoga is a very popular term, probably the most popular term from the Sanskrit language. You pretty much go in any part of the world, there's going to be some yoga studio somewhere. Um, if we go to the root meaning of the term, it comes from two distinct Sanskrit roots. And the meaning of one root is yoga means concentration. And the other meaning of the word yoga, traded to a different root in Sanskrit, it means union or joining. It comes closer to the English word to yoke. Now when we speak about joining, and that's the, how the word is most commonly used in, in Vedanta. Joining, joining of the finite with the infinite. Uh, joining of the individualized embodied self with the Supreme Self or the Supreme Being. Now, the four yogas that have become so popular primarily because of these four books of Swami Vivekananda Bhakti Yoga, Jnana Yoga, Raj Yoga and Karma Yoga. Many of you may have seen them. Another misconception with regard to these yogas is that people tend to distinguish one yoga from another by what we do. It's in the sense that oh, Bhakti Yoga or the path of devotion means these are the things we do in the path of devotion or the path of knowledge, these are what those on the path of knowledge do. But I think that's probably not the best way to distinguish one yoga from another. A better way would be, how are these divisions made in the first place? Sometimes people mistakenly think that these four yogas have been a part of the tradition all along, which is not true. The word yoga is of course very ancient, but the way these four, these yogas were classified into four categories, that was a very distinct contribution of Swami Vivekananda. The words that he used, Jnana Yoga, Bhakti Yoga, etc., the words again were are very ancient, but the way Swamiji used them is very distinctive. So how did we how did he use it? And one helpful way to understand how these four yogas came about is to look at what are the primary instruments we have to in our spiritual practice. Essentially, when we are born we just come with two things, nothing else. We just come with a body and a mind. That's all. Everything else gets added on to our personality later on in life. And it's primarily among the body and the mind, it's the mind that makes a distinct, makes a personality distinctive. Now, let me explain. It's possible to look at the human mind and see that it has primarily three functions. The, the first function of the mind is cognitive. 
the the power that the mind uses to apply reason apply logic to understand what is going on outside of us and also what is happening inside of us so one way we try to grasp or try to understand is through applying the power of reason and power of logic and every mind has that cognitive function the second way the mind functions is what they sometimes call the the affective function when we use the power of emotions and the power of feelings again every mind has this power and a third power that the mind has is the will power the power of the will so these are the three primary powers every mind has um and now that of course primarily all of our philosophizing and theorizing is for human beings so human beings thinking about the world and trying to explain it to fellow human beings for the present let's just limit it to uh, human mind although potentially these three parts are present in every mind even in the mind of the pets that you may have at home now every spiritual discipline irrespective of whichever tradition it is from it doesn't have to be from vedantic tradition because as human beings we are using our bodies and our minds and so when we are using our minds one of these three powers are being used in our spiritual practices so whichever spiritual practice predominantly uses the power of reason the power of logic all of those practices can be classified under the path of knowledge or jnana yoga so rather than defining the path of knowledge objectively with as about what things are done better to look at it subjectively like which function which power of the mind is used to do a certain practice and so all of those practices irrespective of which tradition or which religion they are from can be classified as the path of knowledge now similarly whichever of these practices we predominantly use the power the power of feelings the power of emotions all of those will come under the path of love a path of bhakti the path of devotion now the third the power of the will so those spiritual practicing and disciplining the activities of the mind uh, that is called raj yoga now in all of these cases i use the word predominantly and that is because theoretically it may be possible to say oh, we have these three parts and and wrongly imagine as if there are these three compartments in the mind but it's, there is there are no compartments in the mind there is also this the way we characterize people sometimes we among our friends or the people we know so oh this person is very logical very rational this person is very emotional when we say things like that uh, what we often mean that this one of these three powers of the mind is dominating in that person person's personality or character uh, characteristic so some people in whom the the power of emotion or feeling is very active they might externally appear to their friends as oh this person is very emotional or very sentimental and some people who in whom the power of logic or reasoning is very high people might say this person is very rational and so on now even when we say that some person is very emotional i hope we don't mean this person has no reason at all in their in their or that they don't have any will power at all of course we all have all of these three but one of these three will dominate that is the meaning of now the path of knowledge yes the the power of logic or reasoning is predominating in the path of knowledge that does not mean that those who follow the path of knowledge follow the path of jnana 
are bereft of any sentiments or emotion it's that never happens that way in every yoga in every path in every discipline we need will power emotions and feelings have a role to play in every yoga and therefore none of these walls that seem to separate one yoga from another are non porous walls if you like so they are they're pretty permeable and so it's very difficult objectively to say a certain thing is bhakti yoga or jnana yoga and so on and that's why we might sometimes make a mistake if we think that the way i divide my life or when i'm singing and doing japa i'm doing my bhakti yoga thing or when i'm reading and uh, about philosophy or the upanishads or some of these scriptural texts then that is my knowledge kind of a thing that that would not be the right way to to distinguish them and so when we read swami vivekananda's explanation of these four yogas we see that this idea that a certain path is dualistic a certain is non dualistic this doesn't occur there at all on the contrary every yoga when I mean, you read swami ji's four books we see that every yoga ends with a sense of unity or oneness even in the path of love swami vivekananda ends his exposition of that yoga by saying that the lover love and the beloved they all become one in the end and we see this teaching in all vedanta teachers and it's of course in the life of ramakrishna holy mother sharda devi and swami vivekananda as well that they did not make these very watertight compartmental divisions between dualism and non dualism and so on now what is dualism sometimes these terms can be can sound needlessly technical and um, many of you probably are already aware of them in our lives we see that when we meet someone or hear of something for the first time we are very clear about that they are different and i am different when we think about god as we begin our spiritual journey we are, god does appears to be someone different or someone something whatever you want to think about it is different and i am different but when we see that when we try to get to know something better gradually a connection is established and that's true with regard to to interpersonal relationships as well when you meet a stranger for the first time we know yes that's a person and i'm a person and we are very distinct very different but once a kind of relationship is formed then a kind of a bridge connects us with the other person then that person doesn't appear to be as different as that person may have appeared on our first meeting but as this relationship becomes closer becomes intimate then that bond separating them becomes even shorter and shorter and shorter and the a sense of oneness is reached when the true love grows in the heart exactly in the same way even in our spiritual lives whichever way we think of the supreme the god is a very generic term that is often used when we speak in english about that ultimate reality but different people might use different words to express that idea but in the beginning god appears to be a different being a different person but as we continue with our spiritual quest a kind of a relationship gets built now the nature of that relationship can be very different also in a most impersonal terms god is seen as as the infinite one and me a, a small little speck a small little finite entity but and, and in more theistic terms when we begin to see god as a person 
then the way we describe god become very very different and the most popular way god gets described in personal terms is god the father or god the mother and and then of course if i am related if then i am a child of god or god the creator and i become the creature so there are different ways of looking upon that ultimate reality in impersonal terms as i said it could be just the word in in vedanta that is used is often brahman again not the name of a person literally this sanskrit term brahman simply means the vast one the infinite one again no gender is involved in brahman is neither he nor she nor they nothing brahman is simply beyond even the idea of gender but in personal terms of course then we begin to think of god in terms of either a father a mother a friend there are many different ways a relationship can be conceived of with regard to god now sometimes people think that they have a choice in the matter that i can think of god either as a person or as a beyond personality not really <laughs> <laughs> okay there is one a, a simple um how would you call, how would you think about it it's um okay let me put it this way how we see others is directly related to how we see ourselves and a, a simple way to 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 understand this is that when we look at other human beings we don't need to consult any books to find out are these human beings or who are these it's very easy to recognize other human beings and very effortless because it's easy and effortless to see myself as a human being because i have no doubt i am a human being it's easy for me to look out and say all these are human beings but then we keep on reading and hearing how everyone like god is our parent and we are all children of god but yet how often do i remember that every person i deal with in my life is the child of god that all these i'm sitting here in front of the children of god yes when we are reading about it it kind of the idea is very uplifting but it doesn't stick it doesn't stick because how often do i remember that i'm a child of god so just as the idea that i am a human being has sunk so deep that i never forget it the idea that i am a child of god hasn't gone as deep yet and that is why i need to struggle to remember always that i am dealing with god's children now when i am able to see myself as a child of god it will be very easy for me to look upon everyone as children of god and that's what i meant by saying how we see others is directly related to how we see ourselves in in um, in the indian epic called mahabharata there is a story about we don't have to go into that story but there is this one incident in that book in which two of the protagonist in that book one is a very good person and the other is a embodiment of evil so the names are immaterial but one of them is yudhishthira the other is um duryodhana don't worry about the names so the idea is one of them the good person among them was told go and find out i want you to go around for one day and among the people you meet find out who is the worst person a wicked person that you meet in your it in a day to day and the other person who was pretty bad and wicked and evil was told go around and see which is the really good and honest and nice person you meet in the day and a day later they came back and reported their finds and the one who was good says i went all over i met so many people everyone appeared good to me i really nobody is bad all are good and the other person who himself was very wicked he just looks around and says everyone is wicked everyone is terrible not one good person around 
Swami Vivekananda, in his lectures also, one place he does refer to this. He says that sometimes we complain, oh, how terrible this world is, how selfish everyone is. People are terrible. And then Vivekananda asks this question, what am I doing in this world filled with selfish people and terrible people? I must be terrible also. I must be selfish also. So it's not so much... So what we see outside is a reflection of who we are. Those who have read the life of Ramakrishna and life of many of these great saints and mystics, we see that the world that they saw was so different from the world that you and I see. Although apparently we are all staying in the, or living in the same world. In Ramakrishna's life we see that when he looked around, he just says, everyone is just filled with the bliss of the Divine Mother. He sees the, the, the divine smiling in every face. And we don't see that. that. Now, who is really seeing the reality? Now, normally, we think that that's what democracy is. And democracy, therefore, I think some of the Greek thinkers refer to democracy as the government of fools, which seeing today might appear to be have some truth to that. <laughs> And the reason for that is, the majority does not always have to be right. Usually, the chances of the majority being more sensible than the minority, usually that's true. But when we come to these deeper, subtler, transcendent realities of life, we can question the wisdom whether the majority is always right. Because the world in which Ramakrishna lived, the world, the kind of world he saw is very different from the kind of world you and I see. And therefore it's understandable why during his lifetime, people around him saw that he was crazy because he was seeing things hardly anyone around was seeing them. And that's what people do. when. Even when somebody is seeing the reality, if the majority are not seeing it, they think that's not normal. We, the, the majority, what we see, that's normal. So in spiritual life, that thing can be questioned. And, and Ramakrishna saw the divine present everywhere is because he saw the divine present inside. And so we come back to about uh, we began by saying, or I, sorry, I began by saying that um, we don't so much have a choice in the matter about whether to choose the impersonal reality or the personal reality. We don't so much have a choice whether I want to think of God in personal terms of impersonal terms. We, we think we have a choice, but we don't. Just as, even when we think about these four yogas, we don't so much have a choice whether I should choose the path of knowledge or the path of love. We don't, clearly. It's a little bit like if we go to buy a pair of shoes in a shop. And usually many of us will go and, and then the salesperson will bring out a few pairs and we line them up. And then finally, uh, we choose one. It's an illusion to think that we have made that choice. Although it feels like that, it appears like that. But given the pre-existing ideas in our head about, oh, this color is better for me, this color suits me, and this is blah, 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 the different uh, ideas, I could not but have chosen the kind of pair that I chose. I really didn't have any choice. I was predestined to choose that, although I thought I made a choice. Same is true with regard to choosing a religious path. We think that, uh, that we have a choice about choosing this yoga or that yoga, and we really don't. And therefore, if ever, if at all, not everyone may have that dilemma in life, but if ever, when we read that, that's okay, let, let me just, uh, a kind of a side note on that one, is 
things were a bit easier i would imagine way back centuries ago before even paper and printing was in, invented before the internet when we people didn't have much choice really if they wanted to know if they wanted to learn the only place they could learn it from is from a good and trusted teacher there were no books to go to there were no schools to go to so then the student in that's what we read in the ancient books in the vedic period the student went to the teacher's home that if the teacher found the student is ready to receive knowledge then whatever the teacher taught the student had to learn and the teacher if the teacher is a wise teacher often time what the teacher would do is give the first lesson to the student now that was a theoretical understanding a certain lesson was given the the student was expected not only to understand that lesson intellectually but then to actually live according to that so along with the intellectual understanding would come some amount of experiential knowledge as a result of living according to that lesson given by the teacher now with that experiential knowledge a little bit of a a greater maturity in that student's mind the teacher would give the second lesson so the theoretical understanding increases again the student lives according to that the experience increases third lesson it went in a very structured sort of way the disadvantage in that older method was it wasn't easy to find a teacher you sometimes people had to go long distances to find a teacher it was a process that needed a full investment of one's time and energy we come to more recent times with vietnam introduction of books and printing and and of course the internet so we don't even need uh, books anymore today um, accessibility to knowledge has become much easy anyone can pick up any book and read and 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 the bookstore here has amazing books as you know and so there's a lot to read a lot to understand so that's the plus side on the minus side is first of all not everyone is very judicious about knowing what is what i should read and what i shouldn't or what is what kind of knowledge i'm ready for now and what i'm not ready for and the second thing is sometimes we read a lot our conceptual information increases to a considerable degree but alongside that we have there is not much chance or interest or opportunity to live according to the knowledge that we have acquired either through through books or nowadays through lectures podcasts retreats and so on so kind of a lopsided development occurs sometimes we know a lot more about a subject but that doesn't reflect in the kind of life that we lead and so that's that's the difficulty so one way of going as as someone 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 sometimes swami vivekananda said that uh, in his books we read that um that education or understanding or knowledge is not just about having a lot of ideas but knowing how every idea in our head is connected with every another idea is better to have fewer ideas but see how they are interconnected than to have a lot of ideas and just creating a chaos inside our heads it might it's it's helpful to think of all the dilemmas and questions and doubts that we have in our life all the things all the pieces of knowledge that we have going on in our head as a pieces of a, a jigsaw puzzle and we know that when all the pieces fit together perfectly it's a beautiful picture but if as long as we haven't put it all together it's a big chaotic and so the first thing to do is to use only the pieces that are a part of the picture and so if we want to know something if we want to understand something it's better to have some 
clarity about the right trustworthy sources I should go to and, and use them to, to put all these pieces together in our heads. When we do that, then we discover that my self-understanding is directly related to my understanding of the world around me. Vivekananda once defined religion as the eternal relationship between the eternal soul and the eternal God. So to know who I am, to have some understanding of what that ultimate reality is, and to know how we are connected. And we don't have to necessarily begin with pre-existing or, or, or kind of um, just the ideas we have gathered from everywhere. We can begin with a very open mind. That yes, we might read something in a book, it might make sense intellectually, but then also say, okay, that makes sense intellectually, but where am I now? So all this is to say that as long as I am a person, I cannot but think of God in personal terms. Even when people say that they want to meditate on the impersonal, meditate on the infinite, I mean, wh what is infinite? Beyond the word infinite, what does it even mean? Because the moment we try to visualize it, the moment we try to think about it, the most that we can think about it is, is the vast expanse of the sky or just this big ocean. But the ocean is not infinite. The sky is not infinite. Neither is it impersonal in some way. It, it has a character. And so what we are trying to do is think of some symbol which comes closer to our idea of infinity. That's all. But, but we are still using concrete terms to try to think of the reality which we see is not tangible the way other things are. So that's the second thing to remember. So the personality, impersonality, we don't really get to choose. It's that ideal that really chooses us. So when we begin this practice of our spiritual lives without any biases or prejudices in our heart, the more open we are, a path will open out automatically before us. Then this dilemma, whether it, I should follow the path of love or path of knowledge, will no longer exist. Because no matter what we do or say, we at every step we will find there are this, in, this crossing between these two paths. It happens, crisscrossing appears all the time. In the conversations of Sri Ramakrishna, in that book, The Gospel of Ramakrishna, we see that one of the devotees once says in his presence, um, all I want is devotion, all I want is love, I don't care for knowledge at all. And Ramakrishna was very quick to point out to him, no, no, don't say that. If you don't, if you don't want knowledge at all, how will you even know whom to love? So, It's never one or the other. So we go back to what was said earlier about predominantly. Yes, according to the personality types, according to the things that make best sense to us, some of us might be inclined to think of the spiritual life more in terms of knowledge. Some of us might be inclined to think more in terms of love. Um, some in more relational terms, some in more abstract terms. And that's okay. So long as that hunger to know that higher truth, higher reality is present in my heart. So that's the one final point I want to make before I, before I close. Is It's good to have, in fact it's essential to have self-knowledge. And I'm, I'm referring to the word self-knowledge with a small s. Not, not like the self, the divine self. That self-knowledge will come whenever it comes. But even for that knowledge to come, I must begin with 
the knowledge of my present self as I am now. It's not that easy to judge ourselves the way we judge other people. Sometimes we are better at judging other people and not so good at judging ourselves. And the reason for that is other people, we are objects of our knowledge. And it's easy to kind of see them. Yeah, this is how the person is. This is how I see. This is how I understand. But it's so difficult to objectify ourselves because the ego is so strong, it's kind of so rooted inside that in order for me to judge myself, I have to metaphorically come outside and kind of see who this person is. And therefore, unless and until there is some kind of a ego reduction, we will not have a right understanding of who we are. And, and there is this one story many of you would have heard, how a person uh, was, being, uh, was undergoing uh, psychological tests about whether suffering from uh, an inferiority complex. He had a feeling that I just feel inferior. Uh, it's, and so the psychological tests were being done. Now when the test results came, the, the one who was administering the test told this patient, I have good news for you. You are not suffering from inferiority complex. You are inferior. <laughs> I think that's a good knowledge to start with. Because uh, that, that kind of actually reminded me Mm. <laughs> this was not, I, 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 just, I just remembered this. So there is this one story of a, of a student who went to a spiritual teacher and asked to be taught. And the teacher gave him uh, instructions, taught him how to pray, how to meditate, and he started doing that. And then after a few days, a few weeks, a few months, the student found nothing, nothing much is happening not much has changed. Became very impatient, went to the teacher and said, when, when will I get knowledge? When will I get um, realization? And the teacher said, keep on practicing, it'll come. He went on practicing, a few more days, few more weeks passed, nothing happened. He again goes and kept on pestering the teacher, when will I have my realization? When will I have my realization? Finally, the teacher said, Will you do what I ask you to do? And the, teacher, the student said, absolutely, I'm ready to do. Then the teacher said, okay, next time it rains, I want you to go out on the street, take off your shirt and stand with your hand raised until the rain stops. Stand in the middle of the road with your hand raised until the rain stops. And the student was like, it doesn't make sense. But the student had promised the teacher, I will do exactly what you tell me. So he trusted the words of the teacher. So next time he trained, the student went out on the street, took off his shirt, stood right in the middle with his hand raised. The rain continued for about half an hour, and of course everyone passing on the street was like, what's wrong with this guy? Why is he doing? Anyway, so after about half an hour, the, train, the rain stopped. The, the student goes back to the teacher to report what had happened. And then the teacher said, how did you feel? And then the student said, left to myself, I would never have done anything like that. I just did it because you asked me to do it. But the way everyone was looking at me, I just felt so stupid. And the teacher said, that's a good realization to begin with. So it's good, even if we feel we are stupid, it's good to know that we are stupid. That's what I meant by self-knowledge. <laughs> because I should know what my starting point is. And to the extent we can be objective judge, each of us, objective judge of who we are, we will find, without exception, that yes, I have certain weaknesses. Every one of us will find there are some of areas in life I need to work on. I'll also find that I have certain strengths. How well we are able to do this kind of self-assessment, life going forward becomes much easier than actually. Because 
if i know what my strengths are what my weaknesses are then going forward i need to do or choose everything that removes or eliminates or minimizes my weaknesses or preserves the strength that i already have and if i can keep on working at it preserving my strengths trying to eliminate my weaknesses we will find a more quicker easier transformation in our heart than just kind of a very glibly living in a la la land thing oh i'm going to realization i'm going to see the divine everywhere that doesn't take us anywhere it's good to be very very practical about these matters so good to know what my starting point is so if i have if i know where i am right now at this moment and if i have some idea even if it is not a very clear idea about where i want to go then all that i need to figure out is how do i go from this point a to that point b and that's what sometimes when um, i meet with many students in boston where where i live and work and one of the things i have found is that clearly like all of us whether we are students or not we all want to be successful at whatever we are pursuing in life and so sometimes i do ask people who come what is my idea of success and to some of the students i just say that now you are young but for a few years after 20 30 40 years um how do you visualize yourself after 20 30 40 years what what is your idea of success how do you see yourself as a successful person where will you be after 40 years and then ask yourself that whatever it is i'm doing now whichever way i'm thinking now if i continue to do what i'm doing now will it take me to that place and that's what a spiritual seeker needs to do if whatever goal i have before myself and i ask myself what am i doing at this moment how am i living my life it's not just about how much japa i'm doing it's important of course it's about prayer meditation japa but also how i'm living during my non meditation times it's not that oh i just do meditation two or three times in the day and what i do the rest of the day doesn't matter then then nothing is going to happen because sometimes what i'm doing when i'm not praying when i'm not meditating affects our life more than what we are doing when we are meditating when we are praying and so that would be one way a spiritual seeker irrespective of whether that person is sees themselves on the path of love or path of knowledge have to ask that where i am now and what i should do what i should be doing in order to go where i want to be and one final point would be a helpful thing would be especially in a community life when we are always seeing usually with we are around people who share some of our ideas some of our goals just because of the way our mind has been trained living in the kind of world and society and culture in which we live we keep on comparing ourselves with other people and being successful going ahead would all all often means putting other people behind so i can go ahead of them that does not really help in fact it can be very detrimental to our spiritual progress and therefore it would be helpful that i don't compare myself with people around me it doesn't help in fact it's 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 dangerous uh, what's helpful is i can compare myself with myself so all that i can see is what i am now as a person and what i was 5 years ago or 2 years ago how do i see am i a better person now than what i was before or was i better then than i am now now it doesn't necessarily have to be yes or no we might find that in certain respects i was better 5 years ago and in certain respects i am better now 
So it could be a kind of a mixed picture. But that kind of a comparison is very helpful. Then I know whether I'm progressing or not. That's a better measure of progress than how many visions I have had. I mean, it's great to have visions. Who doesn't want visions? Um, and so on. But, but a better way would be, as a person, do I feel any progress? And this is something that only I will know. Other people can judge me only by my appearance and just the externals. But what's going on inside our heads, only we know if we want to know. And if we have a little bit of an ego reduction to be able to have that unbiased opinion about ourselves. If we take care of some of these, and I know this has not been a very organized way of um, expressing my thoughts, but these are some of the thoughts that have been uppermost in my mind when I think about love, knowledge, the yogas, how they are related to our life, what we should do, what are the things that we should take care of, and so on. So these are some of the points that came to my mind. I'm sure there is a lot that you have thought about in your own lives as well. There are a lot of um, points that can be discussed on this subject. So I hope that some of these thoughts, some of these ideas may be helpful as we continue to grapple with the challenges that we all face, both in our external lives as well as in our internal life. So uh, thank you for your patient hearing. And I'll conclude with a short prayer. Om Jananim Saradam Devim Ramakrishnam Jagat Gurum Padapadme Tayo Shritva Pranamami Mohur Mohoho Peace, peace, peace. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much.